Okay, seven realities of experiencing God. This illustration summarizes the way that you should respond to God's invitation in your life. The texts of the realities is in the margin. Okay, so this is what we were saying before. Okay, so the first one, here's God, God's work. Then that's you. Ultimately, you want to get from one to seven, obey and experience God. But you have to start down here. So, arrow goes down. You have your relationship with God. The invitation from God. That invitation calls you to humble yourself and to listen to him. Ask him what he wants. So, God speaks to you. Not in an audible voice necessarily, but in your mind, your spirit, your conscience. And then all of a sudden you hit number five, which is called crisis of belief. And that, for me, is the hardest part to accept because suddenly it's like, there is no way that I can do what he's calling me to do. There's no way. There, it's either a financial burden, um, something unattainable, uh, it's usually out of our grasp, out of our ability to grasp. So we just kind of stop there and then we we have to just focus and say, wait, wait, wait. Am I going to go back over here to the relationship and the invitation and then say, yes, God, I believe help my unbelief. Okay. So at that moment, when we're willing to surrender and ask Jesus to help us with our unbelief, we make an adjustment, okay? That's us. When we make that adjustment, then we'll go and we will obey. And at that time, you experience God. So I'm going to read down this, this little uh, text over here, which I should have inserted into the uh, video at the beginning or somewhere. All right, so number one. God is always at work around you. So that is a fact. God is always at work around you. We don't see it. We don't feel it. But it is constant when we're sleeping, when we're waking, when we're working. Um, so he's always around you. Number two, God pursues a continuing love relationship with you that is real and personal. Even more so real and personal than that of your spouse, your best friend, your boss, your children. Um, it's, it's him pursuing you, which is kind of crazy to think about. But he's such a gentleman and he does pursue you and he woos you and he talks to you and gives you ideas that are just beyond. Phew, you're just like, no, nah, that that can't be. But then if he keeps pressing it into your heart and there's that desire, it won't go away. And he won't leave you alone until you've made a decision, okay? Number three, God invites you to become involved with him in his work. So now you're having the invitation, which is number three. Number four, this is where we humble ourselves we pray and we listen, okay? Uh, that could be you praying in your bed. That could be you praying in, in a pew at church. That could be you praying in the woods, in nature. Um, I believe the reason there's a little fire here is um, to remind us of Moses at the burning bush. And, you know, the burning bush, first of all, wasn't burning. It was just on fire, but it wasn't being consumed. So... There's something going on here that's supernatural, okay? And all of a sudden, we're going to hit that number five, the crisis of belief. And I used to call it the crisis of faith, but that's not what it is. It's the crisis of belief. That's number five. God's invitation for you to work with him always leads you to a crisis of belief that requires faith and action, okay? Faith is believing what you cannot see coming to fruition, okay? Action is taking the steps blindly. You're believing God, so you're following in the action. 
and you're doing what he's telling you to do, this thing seems impossible. You're just like, you feel foolish. You don't want to tell other people about it. And, or maybe you do. Um, but you're, you're hitting a crisis. Okay. You're like, you're stumped. You don't know what to do. You're like, this is way too big. I can't do it. I don't have the money. I don't have the space. Like if I want to do, um, some kind of large retreat, well, we're only on an acre, so you can't really do a lot. Um, so those are things just to think about. Um, then number six, that's where we go and we adjust, right? We adjust. We have to adjust, surrender, put up the white flag and say, Lord, cause me to believe. Lord, I do believe. I just need your help in believing. Help my unbelief and push me and cause me. And he will do it gently. He's not a, a mean God. He's not, you're, you're telling him that you're willing to do it. So of course he's happy with you, just like you are with your children. When, when they obey and they're very humble and sweet and kind, you want to help them. So God will go side by side with us and, um, and lead us as long as we, um, because it requires faith, faith is blind, and then action. The action we're going to take, even though we can't see where we're going or where this thing is taking us. So we just keep on treading forward, treading forward, treading forward. Uh, of course, six again, the white flag, surrender, adjust your life, and uh, join him in what he's doing, okay? Number seven is that last one. You come to know God by experience as you obey him. Then he is the one that accomplishes his work through you. Okay? Because it's not us doing the work. It is him doing the work through us. All right? Remember that Jesus, even when he was on the earth, he said that even greater works will you do, meaning everybody after he was uh, buried and resurrected and went to heaven, he said, greater works even will you do in 2020, 2022, which is where we are now, greater works 2025, will we all do than even when he was here creating miracles and rising people from the dead, etc. Because, why? Because... We're here in the physical. He was only one, Jesus. We are multiple. And we can get the faith across the world uh, more quickly than he, than he could, believe it or not. He's saying that we can do more works and better works and greater works than even what he did when he was here. Which sounds insane because he actually allowed himself to be crucified. Uh, we don't have to do that. Um... We just listen, obey, and put out the word and spread the gospel. And remember, the quicker we can spread this gospel around the whole world, the quicker that he can come back and get his children. And he promises to come and to get you. And he promises you that he's got a mansion. And it's not a joke. It's not hyperbole. He's got a mansion that is created just for you with the types of desires that are in your heart. My example would be, a beautiful Victorian home, unhaunted, because there's nothing haunted in heaven. A beautiful, perfect Victorian home with multi, um, oh, I can't even think. You know, multiple stairs, spiral stairs, multiple levels, lots and lots and lots of land, cows grazing, horses trotting. Uh, horses that aren't going to knock you off. You know, you don't have to be scared to ride them. Uh, little goats and sheep all eating in the meadow. Uh, little yellow flowers. You don't have um, allergies, sicknesses. There's no snakes and spiders and bugs that are gonna bite you. There's no no. There's no fear. There's just perfection, and that's the desire in my heart for my mansion. Now, is that gonna be what the mansion that he is um, preparing for me? I don't know. I just assume that if. Um, if he's gone to prepare a place for me, then it would be 
maybe the desires that, that are within my heart and the things that I can't actually acquire while I'm down here on earth. However, if I complete this book and I see that I'm actually putting into action my faith, who knows, maybe I'll get those horses and that Victorian house even here on the earth as long as I stay humble because I don't want something over wanting God and Christ. I don't want... He knows better than I do. He's not going to give me something that's going to take me away from him. Riches. Um, everything on the earth. Because then what happens? You get bored. Money will make you bored. Too much money will make you bored. Because you're, you've done it all. You, the, the world is boring, honestly. I mean, you could go visit France and Italy and Spain and Europe and England and whatever you can visit anywhere but you can go multiple times you can go to disney world over and over and over and over and over, and over again but it's like that desire eventually just burns out and you don't if you're like me you get bored you know there's something more in the coming heavens and the new earth that is satisfying to our soul than anything that's down here. And that's for eternity. That's never ending joy. So that's what I want. And I believe this is what you want. Uh, hmm. I think that's really cool. All right. Let me keep looking to see what else I want to share with y'all. 